formation. Located deep to the cerebral cortex is the white matter composed of large collections of myelinated fibers. The fibers which make up the white matter differ in length and are oriented in different directions to carry information between areas within the cerebrum and between the cerebrum and other parts of the central nervous system. Lying deep within the white matter are collections of gray matter called basal nuclei or basal ganglia. They function to influence muscle movements controlled by the motor cortex. The basal nuclei seen in this section include the caudate nucleus and the lentiform nucleus, which is composed of the putamen and globus pallidus. The caudate and lentiform nuclei constitute the corpus striatum. As previously described, the diencephalon is surrounded by the cerebral hemispheres. The large thalamus, which is composed of bilateral masses of gray matter containing many different nuclei, forms the superolateral walls of the third ventricle. The midbrain, which develops from the mesencephalon, is the region of the brainstem between the diencephalon and the pons. Important features of this region include the cerebral peduncles, which contain descending motor fibers from the cerebral cortex, and four large structures on the dorsal surface. These are the superior colliculi, which are visual reflex centers, and the inferior colliculi, which are auditory reflex centers. The four structures are collectively called the corpora quadrigemina. The narrow cerebral aqueduct connecting the third and fourth ventricles is also located in this region. In this horizontal section through the midbrain, we can identify several of the structures we have just described and some of the midbrain nuclei and fibers. On the dorsal surface of the midbrain, lying posterior to the cerebral aqueduct, are the superior and inferior colliculi. The reticular formation of loosely clustered nuclei can also be seen in this section of the midbrain. This scattered collection of nuclei is part of a core of nuclei and fibers which extends throughout the brainstem to connect with other parts of the central nervous system. The reticular formation as a whole has many functions, including controlling skeletal muscle movements, filtering sensory input, influencing the autonomic nervous system and endocrine system, and regulating the arousal of brain activity. The red nuclei and substantia nigra are not part of the reticular formation and can also be identified in this specimen. The substantia nigra are the largest nuclear masses in the midbrain. These nuclei, which affect muscle tone, contain granules of melanin pigment that give the substantia nigra a dark color. The red nuclei, important relay nuclei and several descending motor pathways, are situated between the cerebral aqueduct and the substantia nigra. The red nuclei are reddish in color due to their rich vascular supply and the iron which is contained within the cytoplasm of the neuron cell bodies. Large collections of descending motor tracts are located within the cerebral peduncles. When the cerebellum is removed from the rest of the brain, we can see that it is composed of two cerebellar hemispheres, joined by the vermis, which is named because of its worm-like appearance. The fourth ventricle is bordered ventrally by the pons and the medulla oblongata. The dorsal wall is formed by the cerebellum. The cerebellum functions subconsciously and is important in coordinating muscle movements and in balance and equilibrium. In this medial view, the arbor vitae arrangement of white matter can be seen resembling the branching of a tree. <laughs> 
The internal structure of the cerebellum can be reviewed when the cerebellum is coronally sectioned and examined in this view. It is composed of three layers of tissue similar to the cerebrum. These include an outer layer of gray matter, the cerebellar cortex, an inner layer of white matter, and collections of deep cerebellar nuclei located within the white matter. The cerebellar cortex and deep cerebellar nuclei regulate smooth, coordinated, and efficient movements of voluntary muscles. The white matter of the cerebellum contains axons which relay information between nuclei within the cerebellum and to and from nuclei in other parts of the central nervous system. The pons, which is derived with the cerebellum from the metencephalon, contains many nuclei and fibers that interconnect with the cerebrum, cerebellum, and spinal cord. The medulla, which arises from the embryonic myelencephalon, also contains many nuclei and ascending and descending fibers. Many of these descending fibers travel in the pyramids, which can best be seen on the ventral surface of the medulla. The olives, which lie lateral to the pyramids, are the sites of the underlying olivary nuclei. The medulla is a very important autonomic reflex center, playing a primary role in respiration and circulation. It is continuous inferiorly with the spinal cord. The internal anatomy of the medulla oblongata can be reviewed in this horizontal section. As previously described, the pyramids contain large motor tracts traveling from the cortex to the spinal cord. Ribbon-like folds of gray matter called the inferior olivary nuclei contribute to the formation of the olives. These nuclei send axons which project to the cerebellum and carry information about muscles and joints. The medial lemniscus is located posterior to the pyramid and medial to the inferior olivary nucleus on each side of the medulla. The fibers contained in these tracts carry sensory information about limb position from the spinal cord to the thalamus. Fiber tracts which connect the medulla with the cerebellum are located in the inferior cerebellar peduncles. Also seen in this specimen are several cranial nerve nuclei and the reticular formation whose general functions were described with the midbrain. We will now demonstrate the location of the 12 pairs of cranial nerves on the inferior surface of the brain and the foramina which transmit them through the skull. Several of the blood vessels to the brain have been removed on one side to demonstrate the nerves more clearly. The olfactory bulb and tract lie on the undersurface of the frontal lobe. Cranial nerve 1, fibers carrying sensory impulses of smell from the nose to the brain, enter the skull through the cribriform plate of the ethmoid bone. This is the optic nerve, chiasm, and tract. Cranial nerve 2 enters the skull through the optic foramen from the eyeball. This nerve transmits impulses of vision to the occipital cortex. The oculomotor nerve, cranial nerve 3, arises from the midbrain near the midline. The fourth cranial nerve, the trochlear, is the only nerve which originates on the dorsal side of the brainstem. 
it courses around the midbrain to exit on its ventral surface. Both cranial nerves 3 and 4 travel through the superior orbital fissure. They primarily control movements of most of the extrinsic eye muscles. The large trigeminal nerve, cranial nerve 5, has three divisions, the ophthalmic division, the maxillary division, and the mandibular division. These divisions course through the skull via three different foramina. The ophthalmic division fibers travel from the face to the pons through the superior orbital fissure. The maxillary division fibers are transmitted from the face through the foramen rotundum. And the mandibular division fibers are carried through the skull via the foramen ovale. The trigeminal nerve functions to provide sensory information from the face and part of the scalp and is motor to the muscles of mastication. The abducens nerve, cranial nerve 6, also travels with the third, fourth, and fifth nerves through the superior orbital fissure. It primarily controls movement of the lateral rectus eye muscle. Cranial nerve 7, the facial nerve, and cranial nerve 8, the vestibulocochlear nerve, are both located near the junction of the pons, medulla, and cerebellum. The facial nerve enters the temporal bone through the internal auditory meatus and exits the skull through the stylomastoid foramen. It controls the muscles of facial expression and is sensory to taste on the anterior two-thirds of the tongue. The vestibulocochlear nerve has fibers which arise in the inner ear and travel through the internal auditory meatus to the pons. These fibers are associated with hearing and equilibrium. Cranial nerve 9, the glossopharyngeal nerve, is located near the facial and vestibulocochlear nerves but its fibers emerge instead from the medulla. It courses through the jugular foramen to innervate the posterior tongue and throat. 
The tenth cranial nerve, the vagus, also emerges from the medulla and descends through the jugular foramen to innervate structures in the neck, thorax, and abdomen. Cranial nerve 11, the accessory nerve, has fibers which arise from both the medulla and the spinal cord. The spinal fibers come from the superior cervical segments and ascend through the foramen magnum to join with fibers from the medulla. They exit together through the jugular foramen to go to the neck and shoulder regions. Fibers of cranial nerve 12, the hypoglossal nerve, exit from the medulla between the pyramid and olive. They travel to the tongue through the hypoglossal canal. In this view of the interior of the skull, the cerebrum has been removed and the brain sectioned at the midbrain level to demonstrate the course of several of the cranial nerves we have just described. The dura mater is intact, except over the right superior cerebellar hemisphere. The olfactory nerve enters the anterior cranial fossa through the cribriform plate. Emerging from the optic canal is the optic nerve. Traveling toward the superior orbital fissure is the oculomotor nerve and the smaller trochlear nerve. Also coursing through this fissure are the ophthalmic division of the trigeminal nerve and the abducens nerve. The maxillary division fibers are transmitted from the face through the foramen rotundum, and the mandibular division fibers are carried through the skull via the foramen ovale. In this presentation, we reviewed the external and internal anatomy of the brain and the location of the cranial nerves. The pathway of the cranial nerves through the skull was also described. The anatomy of the spinal cord and the distribution of the spinal nerves are discussed in the videotape entitled The Human Nervous System, The Spinal Cord and Spinal Nerves. The human nervous system can be divided into two major parts, the central nervous system and the peripheral nervous system.
The central nervous system consists of the brain and spinal cord. The peripheral nervous system is composed of cranial nerves, which carry impulses to and from the brain, and spinal nerves, which transmit impulses to and from the spinal cord. The videotape entitled The Human Nervous System, The Brain and Cranial Nerves, describes the anatomy of the brain and the origin and course of the cranial nerves through the skull. In this presentation, we will review the spinal cord and the organization and distribution of the spinal nerves. The spinal cord is surrounded by three layers of meningeal tissues. Seen in this dissection is the tough outermost dura mater layer. It is a continuation of the dura which covers the brain. The dura surrounds the spinal cord through the cervical, thoracic, and lumbar vertebral levels and terminates at the second sacral vertebral level. Here, it becomes the coccygeal ligament, which attaches to the coccyx. With the dura opened and reflected, we can easily see the second meningeal layer, the arachnoid, in the cervical region. This membrane is very thin, transparent, and glistening in this specimen. It has very delicate connections to the innermost pia mater, which will be seen when the arachnoid membrane is excised. The arachnoid layer accompanies the dura mater to the level of the second sacral vertebra. In this view, the arachnoid layer has been opened to expose the spinal cord. Several vessels can be seen on its posterior surface. The pia mater tightly adheres to the surface of the cord just as it does to the surface of the brain. The pia extends laterally to form the denticulate ligaments which appear whitish in this specimen. These anchor the spinal cord to the dura mater and help to protect the cord from excessive movement in the canal. The spinal cord nervous tissue begins as a continuation of the medulla oblongata at the foramen magnum. The spinal cord normally terminates between the first and second lumbar vertebral levels in the adult and between the third and fourth lumbar vertebral levels in the newborn. This cone-shaped termination is the conus medullaris. The phylum terminale, which is a thread of pia mater, begins at the conus medullaris and continues inferiorly through the dural and arachnoid layers to terminate on the periosteum of the coccyx as part of the coccygeal ligament. It helps to anchor the cord and to prevent displacement. This collection of long nerve roots in the lumbar and sacral levels is called the cauda equina because of its resemblance to a horse's tail. The spinal cord has two regions which are slightly larger and which correspond to the areas where the cell bodies are located and the nerves to the upper and lower extremities arise. The cervical enlargement is approximately located between the fifth cervical and second thoracic vertebral levels. The lumbar enlargement is found between the ninth and twelfth thoracic vertebral levels. Using this illustration of a cross-section of the spinal cord in the thoracic region, we will review the anatomy of the cord and the formation of the spinal nerves. The spinal cord is partially divided into two halves by the posterior median sulcus and the anterior median fissure. The gray matter, usually in the shape of an H or resembling a butterfly, contains multipolar neuron cell bodies unmyelinated processes, and neuroglia. The gray commissure surrounding the central canal connects the two masses of gray matter. Paired projections of the gray matter extend posteriorly and anteriorly. The posterior and anterior horns are present at all levels of the spinal cord. However, the size and shape of the horns will vary depending on the level.
an additional pair of projections of gray matter, which are found in the thoracic and upper lumbar cord levels, are the lateral horns. They house autonomic motor neurons of the sympathetic division. In the posterior, or dorsal horns, many of the afferent, or sensory fibers in the dorsal roots synapse with interneurons. The cell bodies of origin of the fibers within the dorsal roots are located in the dorsal root ganglia. Somatic motor neurons are contained in the anterior, or ventral horns, and send efferent, or motor fibers, to skeletal muscles through the ventral roots. The union of the dorsal and ventral roots form the spinal nerves. Laterally, each spinal nerve divides into a dorsal and ventral ramus. In this close-up view of the cervical region, we will now identify the components of a spinal nerve. The dorsal root, which is composed of several rootlets, carries sensory information to the cord. The ventral rootlets, which form the ventral root, carry motor information away from the spinal cord. The dorsal root ganglion, which contains the cell bodies of origin of the sensory neurons, is located on the dorsal root near the intervertebral foramen. The dorsal and ventral nerve roots combine to form a spinal nerve. Each spinal nerve further branches into a ventral ramus and a dorsal ramus. The white matter of the spinal cord is organized into columns of fiber tracts external to the gray matter. These columns include the posterior, lateral, and anterior funiculi named based on their position within the cord. Sensory and motor fiber tracts, which ascend and descend through the cord, are located in specific regions within the funiculi. The shape and size of the spinal cord, including the gray and white matter, vary with different levels of the cord. Using these cross sections of a spinal cord, we can compare the internal anatomy of the cord at the cervical, thoracic, lumbar, and sacral cord regions. As the spinal cord ascends from sacral to cervical regions, the amount of white matter increases. The white matter increases in mass because sensory fibers are entering the cord at all levels and adding to the bulk of fibers as the cord ascends toward the brain. The largest numbers of fibers are added in the cervical and lumbar regions where fibers carrying sensory input from the limbs enter the spinal cord. The white matter also contains motor fibers descending from the brain to synapse with anterior horn cells in the cord. These fibers contribute to the mass of white matter in the cord. Many of these fibers terminate at the cervical level and synapse with motor neurons that control skeletal muscles in the upper limbs. Others continue inferiorly to synapse on motor neurons which regulate skeletal muscle contraction in the lower limbs. There are 31 pairs of spinal nerves, which include 8 pairs of cervical nerves, 12 thoracic pairs, 5 lumbar pairs, 5 sacral pairs, and 1 pair of coccygeal nerves. The ventral rami of spinal nerves T2 through T12 form thoracic intercostal nerves. All other ventral rami branch and rearrange their fibers to form complicated networks or plexuses, which include the cervical, brachial, lumbar, and sacral plexuses. The cervical plexus is formed from ventral rami of the upper four cervical nerves. Cutaneous nerves of this plexus transmit sensory impulses from skin overlying the neck, ear, and shoulder regions.
The ventral ramus of C2 primarily contributes to the formation of the lesser occipital nerve. It supplies the skin on the posterolateral neck, the scalp posterior to the ear, and the superior part of the ear. The great auricular nerve is formed from ventral rami of C2 and C3. It furnishes cutaneous innervation to the skin of the inferior ear and the parotid region. C2 and C3 also contribute to the formation of the transverse cervical nerve which supplies the skin over the anterior and lateral neck. The skin of the shoulder and anterior chest are served by three supraclavicular nerves which arise from the ventral rami of C3 and C4. Motor nerves from the cervical plexus innervate skeletal muscles in the anterior and deep neck regions and the diaphragm, which separates the thoracic and abdominal cavities. The nerves to the infrahyoid muscles arise from C1 through C3 and are branches of the superior and inferior roots of the ansa cervicalis. Deeper muscles of the neck are supplied by other segmental muscular branches from the plexus. The most important motor branch of the cervical plexus is the phrenic nerve. It arises from C3, C4, and C5 to supply the diaphragm. Using this illustration, we will review the formation of the brachial plexus and its nerves which control muscles of the upper limb and provide cutaneous innervation to the region. The brachial plexus is formed from the ventral rami of spinal nerves C5 through T1, with contributions from C4. Each ventral ramus is called a root, which is a mid-